Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Play Portal, the 1986 computer novel written by Rob Swigert. This is the Amiga version and this is our 13th session with this experience. I um, I hope it's a lucky one. Um, I doubt it's going to be the last because if the, the tempo of the the previous sessions is anything to go by, I think we're, we're in for at least uh, a couple more before um, things get anywhere. I'll start loading up Med 10, our first, our first visit for database entries. So, as I've said before, um, if you'd like to catch up with what's going on in this story, because it, it's getting increasingly convoluted, then please do uh, check out the playlist for previous episodes, and you can you can start all the way from the beginning when we were uh, streaming the game originally. Let's check in with Silink. Um, I'm recording while well, there are some roadworks outside, so we'll see how that works out for us. Um, at the moment, they seem to be, be being quite quiet, so with luck, we can get a whole recording session in. There's nothing in signing. Well, either, either that or they will um, add to the foley, hopefully, and not drown my voice out. Okay, let's see if there's anything in SciTech. I don't think we've really got any particular hints at the end of last session. One thing I did want to bring up, um, and this is the reason I named the last episode the way I did, um, was that I found it really interesting that um, the character we'd read the stats for most recently was one who sort of played a, um, a minor role in the drama when we uncovered more of the the narrative section. I wonder so I wonder if uh, it's purely a coincidence that we'd read about Beth Rain heard just before um, she came to prominence in the story and um, appears to have died. Or whether or whether that would be I mean, I, I don't think this program is sophisticated enough to have programmed in um, that it would substitute the name of the most recently read character for that that role, um, but it could have done. Um, I just I just doubt that's the case. It probably is a coincidence, but either way, it was um, surprisingly effective how that turned out for us. Okay, so we found nothing so far, so we're back to life support, and we'll have to pick up on our next character if we want to get through this list. So. Tom Hughes is the next person to, to look at. So Tom Hughes, signed male, born on the 19th of March 2057. That's, um, yeah, that's fine. In Springfield, so another one of the, that gang. Um, and blood pressure stats uh, are going to appear to us here. And then we can have a look at the temperature graph for Tom there. We can have a look at respiratory and GSR. That's that one. And heart rate and EEG is there. So tension and those sets of stats. Um, DNA and hormones. There we are, Endo, endo's up and down a bit. Uh, neurotransmitters. There we are, one up, one down. Glycogen. There, that's that one. Okay, so we've ticked that off the list. And then we'll just pop into geography. Yeah, so one, oh, there is something here, Ross Ice Shelf. That's presumably a location that Peter DeVore uh, and co are going to be heading to um, quite soon. So let's have a look at that. And if we get an image, we do. Let's have a, there you go. That's uh, mildly descriptive, isn't it? Okay, so. Uh, the text, though, is just McMurdo circa 2075, 
parentheses geog ref 2075 stroke double a stroke omnicron one end parentheses ross c ross ice shelf in the vicinity of mcmurdo the double a mcmurdo landing facility is located on the ice itself aef put down here okay yeah that's that's fair enough Yeah, so that's that was all that was. Yeah, so I think I was saying uh, before we found that that the, one of the reasons I doubt that we're um, we're that close to the end of the game is that um, so I'm still assuming that uh, Peter Devore's plan uh, to move humanity beyond its mortal form. Um, takes place and that's the reason why there are no people on the planet today uh, but uh, I don't know for certain but for that to work not everything has fallen into place they don't really seem to have the they might have the mathematical foundation for it but they don't seem to have the means of doing that um, and we still haven't really found out what the portal exactly is so in my notes you can see on screen that uh, we've mentioned that the portal leads to the realm which leads to migration but none of those things have been really explicated um, in any way. So I feel like there's, there's probably quite a lot to wade through before we get to that point. So this is Tom Hughes's family tree, um, descended from Sarah Hughes and Gray Hughes. Gray Hughes is the child of Evita Hughes and James Hughes, and Sarah Hughes is the child of Barney Nelson and Nancy Nelson. Okay, so we've got uh, the old uh, physiology and ESP, and then basic core IQ, one of the sets of stats of these, uh, is presented that way. There you go. And then we're off to psychology for more of the stats for Tom. So here's Tom. Okay, so emotional record for Tom Hughes. There we go. Pretty level across the board there. Um, uh, an assessment of personal growth. I like that. And these basic core IQ stats are reckoned to be these. There you go. All right, so well, let's hope there's something in central processing, shall we? Oh, yeah, there is. Upload military file L85987 stroke A. Oh, there's a picture, I think. Is that a picture? Yes, it looks like some ice. AEF action plan. Note LN armoured personnel carriers in phalanx formation. Expected and resistance determined attack pattern. LN vehicles work well on ice. Large salt cycle transport code represents initial landing party. Okay. But, yeah, if you say so. So that's the end of that category the end of the new entries in that category. So we're off to Edmod, which will be the last section of details for Tom Hughes. So just wait for those to load in. We'll have a look at basic core IQ. There you go, so that's the last selection of uh, assessments for basic core IQ. And then we'll have a look at the, uh, the logic chart there and we will have a look at social adjustment which is reckoned to be like this and memory is this yeah, it looks quite high doesn't it okay thank you tom um let's see so we've read two new entries so that might be enough to qualify for some more story time with homer let's find out
Oh, it's only ears. We've got two. Um, EH. Can I think who EH is? I'm sure the story will tell me, but this one should be Regent Seyor. Primary antagonist. And probable biological father of Peter Devore. Sable waited impassively as the ships landed. The sudden storm was not part of the AEF plan, but it worked for them as well as against them. After all, it covered their actions. The ENC commander approached. Excuse me, Protector. The last transport will be down in 30 minutes, shouldn't we? Yes, I suppose you're right, Commander Agano. Very well, let's get moving. Oh, that was it. <laughs> I was clicking exactly more. That that was like the first... Okay. Uh, okay, Homer. Uh, okay, E.H. I can think of E.H. Shepard, the uh, illustrator winning the Pooh. Okay, uh, oh, this has got more, this will be longer. Okay. Hoskins? Do I know who Hoskins is? I don't think. Was Hoskins one of the soldiers from last time? Must be some E. Hoskins, mustn't it? Uh, I hope Hoskins wasn't the person I did the deep voice for. I think I think they are. Okay, alright. We'll okay, well, I'll, I'll try and crack out the deep voice again. Hoskins heaved a sigh of relief when his mass detectors told him they were over land. The mountain now loomed on the low frequency radar. Get up some speed, he ordered. I'd like to get as high up the slopes as we can before we have to walk. That was not far as it turned out. The slopes were ice, and the propulsion field, which functioned well on the horizontal, couldn't get a grip for the uphill struggle. Hoskins ordered the men out. The storm swirled around them, threatening to sweep them off their feet, but they hooked together and moved up toward the entry port. An hour's climb through jagged ice clumps, slick blue ice, harsh rock outcroppings and endless wind brought them to the entry. The door, oddly enough, was locked. They know we're coming, Dens observed. Yes, it would seem so. Hoskins answered in a tone that might have been sarcastic, or might as easily have been merely disappointed. He waved up his assault programmer. See if you can do something about this door. The programmer went to work. The rest of the team sat down, huddled against the bare rock beside the entry, to wait. Okay, but so they've done a... Are they just doing a trek to get to like the main settlement for the... Um, the place they're trying to invade? Is that...? Because in the Peter Devore section we read last, soldiers already infiltrated underground, and they were... Yeah, they were in a firefight, basically. So, if that, maybe those things are just out of sync? I think they are, because those bits were put before the things we read last time. Um, so it's kind of... I do find it quite meaningless sometimes when it goes back and fills in details that you don't need because the drama's moved forward and you've already assumed the characters did get from A to B because they've appeared in B. So I, I do, yeah. Anyway, let's go through another round of these categories. Okay, nothing in Med 10 again. Ah, that's Silink. No, there's nothing there. Cytec. Oh, yeah. Uh, three. Three entries, in fact. All right, ComComp AI, which is very easy to say. Um, we might get a nice image as well. What do we... No, we just get a corrupted Homer again. All right, so this is current entry, ComComp AI, Ref Antarctica Extrapolation, CP Stroke Cytec AI. 
Only scattered data remains available on ComComp AI technology. Much has vanished from military DB. ComComp was a communications computation artificial intelligence bred to maintain battle communications, both tactical and strategic within a matrix of the overall plan. Antarctic conditions proved a match for the best intercorp ComComps, however. This was true partially because of what was later determined to be a lack of solid intelligence and foresight, and partly due to the unrealised severity of the atmospherics that prevailed during the AEF action. Comcomps were forced to daisy chain through closed fibre monofilament. You know what, I hate, I hate it when I'm forced to daisy chain through closed fibre monofilament. I just want to, you know, just want to daisy chain unfettered. Uh, nav simulator. Yeah, again, no, uh, no special image for that. Right, so current entry, nav simulator. Modest AI used for navigation in terrain unfamiliar to the controller. The nav simulator offered a variety of optical and oral output, including holographic depictions of local terrain, vehicle route, time and distance vectoring, satellite hologram locating, low frequency radar, sonar, LF subsurface sampling and analysis. End of entry. Okay. So I think these are all just things that have been uh, mentioned in passing in in text in one form or other. Um, oh, now we get we get a um, an illustration of this armored personnel carrier, um, parentheses LN. I th I don't know. Have we seen that before? It looks um it looks a peculiar shape to me, but there you go. I think those might be guns sticking out the sides. Maybe. Current entry, Armoured Personnel Carrier, parentheses LN, Rift Antarctic Extrapolation CP Stroke SciTech AI. Intercorp Elite Neutralization Core Liquid Nitrogen Armoured Personnel Carriers were fortified high powered versions of the standard 200 seat LN transport. Outside of the military DV, parentheses DNA code required for clearance, and parentheses, Little specific information beyond rough schematics of the exterior is available. It is known that the LN APC contained a full complement of ComComp and NAV simulator guidance, AI equipment, and battle communications, as well as a full array of mass neurophage cannon and mind bomb projectors. A typical APC complement was said to include up to a full company, including supply, maintenance and support personnel, and could sustain them in hostile environments for a week. LN APCs had only been had been used only once during the so-called Vostok incident, and were thus relatively unproved in combat situations. All right, okay. Well, that's the end of those entries for now. And now we'll check in with history, just in case anything's popped up there in the meantime. No, doesn't look like it. Military? I feel like more things could be appearing in military by this point. Let's crack in here. Thanks, Homer. Um, assault programmer. There you go. Get another detail. Yes, but the program was mentioned. Um, Yes, yeah, so really most of what we... Ooh, we're getting a... Classified. <gasps> but I'm reading it. I feel naughty. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so really what we're getting are footnotes in the majority for, um, for things that are being mentioned. Ranks include AP, AP1, AP Specialist and Warrant AP. Comes under command of ENC Tactical Stroke Strategic Programming Command. Assault programmers were expected to be trilingual in standard defence programming language (parentheses SDPL, SIDPAL, Level 7 Input Stroke Output Directive) and one of the 14 minor tactical assault programming command structures. Equipment included biocrystal induction taps with phonic drivers for bypassing target defensive protection schemes, 
Minicomp Algo search modules for sorting combinations in real time, and in the AP Specialist category, Crystal Data Mastoid Implants for Mind Link Bypass Operations. I don't know, sounds painful and uncomfortable to me. Okay, that was that. Yeah, so basically that's a, a, a computer programmer um, whose main task is to uh, to program or reprogram for, uh, for war. So, uh, next person in our long list of personnel. I wonder if we've got the... Um, no, we haven't had anybody added to the end. I wonder if the soldiers that are reading about um, would have entries as well, but they don't appear to be there yet. Right, we need to read about Teth Epstein as the next person. So let's have a look at them. Uh, okay, Teth Epstein, assigned female, born on the uh, 4th of July 2059 in Springfield. Let's have a look at Teth's blood pressure. There we go. And temperature. There. And we'll have a look at respiratory and GSR while we're here. We might as well. There we go. Um, heart rate and DEG. For curiosity state. There we go. Tension chart. There we go. Our graph of DNA and hormones. There we are. Neurotransmitters. There. And glycogen. There. Alright, so that's that one done. So we'll pop into geography, see if there's anything else about Antarctica that's uh, come to light? Doesn't look like it. No. Okay, what's that then for more, more TEF stats? There we go, TEF. So we can have a look at TEF's family tree in a moment. There we are. So Tef Epstein, child of Mel Epstein, Lucy Epstein. Mel Epstein is the child of Glynis Epstein and Arnold Epstein. And Lucy Epstein is the child of Joyce Riley and Petros Riley. Physiology and ESP. There we go, that chart there. And a basic core IQ. Those stats there. And I'm not going to go back to the main menu, do I? Um, we'll jump straight into psychology. Why not? And have a look at um, Teth's stats in this section. So we've got emotion. We've got personal growth. Okay. And we have basic core IQ. There. Alright, back to the main menu. Central processing might throw us another. You never know. Uh, doesn't look like it will this time though. No, that's fine. So then we'll finish off the last of Tef stats in Edmod. Next page down, there's Tef. Um, we'll start at the bottom this time, why not? Social adjustment. There we go, that's very level. Um, memory. Glad nobody's uh, ever charted my memory. Okay, 
basic core IQ. And logic. There we go. Oh, look at that jump for inductive reasoning. Brilliant. Okay, so that's got us through another round, um, quite quickly it seems. Um, and let's see what home has for us. Hoping for a big, juicy nugget of progress. That would be. That would be welcome. There's a few things there. I wonder if we were supposed to jump back to the SciTech entries before getting to Homer originally. Um, I'll start with the, the first uh, of these. So it's another Hoskins entry after the previous Hoskins entry and before the soldiers encounter Peter Devore, I think. And I'm probably going to have to do the voice. According to their nav simulator, the convoy was over halfway to Mount Erebus, and still they could hear the transports whistling in, onto the ice behind them, one every ten minutes. Even over the sound of wind and groaning ice, and the hum of the field they could hear, every landing meant more reinforcements, more strength. For some reason, Captain Hoskins reflected, the storm and the ice and the terrible cold sapped his sense of security. He could tell the men behind him were getting restless too. These were the best though, the elite of the elite. They wouldn't crack, despite the unfamiliar weather, the uncertain surface over which they moved. The others, the ones coming behind, they had the tough job. They had to go down into the ice warrens, ferret out the ants from their burrows, with nothing but hand-carried mass detectors and MP weapons. The armoured personnel carrier moved smoothly. There was no hint of the unsteady surface. It shouldn't be unsteady, of course. The ice was up to 700 metres thick in places. Here it was not so thick, of course. But this was where the ants had built their launch facility, and the ants, after all, did know ice. They lived with it. It was their home. Why is that thought so disturbing? he asked aloud. What's that? Sergeant Dens asked. Nothing, Hoskins said. Never mind, it was just a thought. Dens turned back to the now simulator with a grunt. He sat up abruptly. Captain, take a look at this. What is it? There's a power source below. Looks like, oh, oh, looks like, oh, 106 meters down. So what? The ants have power. They could live without it. Yeah, but what are those funny looking spokes coming out? Looks like a crescent of projected power. Good question. Go protect a sable on the comlink. It's no good, Captain, Den said, suddenly very formal. The atmospherics are overwhelming the error checking protocols. We're not getting through. So Daisy chained it back through the convoy. Right away, sir. Dens went to work. The groaning sound seemed suddenly louder and the ice did not seem so firm. I see. Okay, uh, then we've got a Regent Sable entry. Um, it took 20 minutes for the Daisy Chain comlink to reach Regent Sable. By then the invasion force was spread across 10 miles of ice. An arrow pointed at the heart of the McMurdo Warrens, with a leading branch headed toward Mount Erebus. The groaning of the ice was almost deafening by now. Does that sound natural? The commander asked. His voice, while under control, showed strain. I really wouldn't know, commander. I'm not an ant. No, of course not. Incoming message, sir, the communications officer said. Erebus Command has detected a power source under the ice. So, what do they make of it? The message is garbled, sir. Seems all this stray electromagnetic radiation and particle activity is playing havoc with the computers. They had to string fibre from car to car, but it sounds like they think it might be a weapon of some sort. Commander Organo said, We've had no intelligence they were building a weapon. It looks as if we may have had no intelligence, period. Sable answered dryly. Never mind. 
he told the communications officer. Tell him to proceed. We can't do anything until we see what this so-called weapon does. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So that's what the... I mean, so uh, are we thinking Doomsday Doomsday Weapon is going to be the, the abrupt end of this story? It could be, couldn't it? So I think, has this unlocked an extra one at the end? I think it has. Right, so we've got another Hoskins entry here. It's no good. The assault programmer said. They've got some tricky new algorithms working here. It'll take days to sort it out. Hoskins frowned. The wind howled past their precarious perch on the side of the mountain. He could barely see the outcropping, less than ten metres away, just a blurred outline in the flying snow. For a moment he lifted his visual amplifiers and stared into the darkness. Then he shrugged and lowered them again. All right, he said. I guess we have no choice. He motioned the assault programmer aside and waved for the two demolitions men. They crouched by the door and carefully laid the strips over the entrance circuit lines. They all ducked back, and one of the men triggered the strips. They could hear the hiss of the strips as they ate through their way through the alloy, the spitting sound of misfiring picoelectronic circuitry. Then the world blew up. <laughs> oh god! It... So, are we talking... Is this is this um, hyperbole, or is the is this is this the end of the story? Did the world actually just blow up at that point? Was all the Peter Divorce stuff just uh, a red herring, and um, <laughs> and all that happened was a doomsday weapon went off? Um, because I feel like we could have cut to the chase a bit quicker if that's if that's what's happening. So this is an RH entry. I can't. I don't know if I can think who RH is. Um, and an AS entry. Let's find out. Oh, Raz Hajam and Aleph Shamana. There's, so those are two kind of advisors and colleagues of Regent Tables, I seem to recall. So Raz Hajam and Aleph Shamana monitored the AEF from Montevideo. Communications were so bad, they had only the sketchiest idea what was happening. But the good news had come through reliably, reliably that all transports were safely down on the ice. As soon as they heard, Raz gave the order for the second wave to move in toward the old Soviet ice base at Druzhnaya, Druz a short atmospheric flight. That part of the AA coast held only a few scientific outposts concerned with sea farming and Antarctic ecology. From the beachhead established at Drishnaya, the AEF would fan out, picking off one small warren after another while attention was focused on the main force at McMurdo. I don't like the disruption in communication. Aleph mused. It's messy. You're worried about region, of course. Raz was in his said in his precise way. But he'll take care of himself. Protector Sable has led incursions of this sort before. He has always been successful. Yes, she answered thoughtfully. He has, hasn't he? She watched in silence as the atmospheric transports took off in formation. It is time we brought Antarctica into the fold of Intercorp, Raz mused. They have too long been a disruptive force in the world, and we have need of their expertise. That sounds suspiciously like cynical imperialism, Aleph said with a smile. But knowing you, Raz, I'm sure that, is, that it isn't. Not in the least, he said negligently. The sound of the second wave dwindled into the distance, and when asked by an aide, he approved departure of the third wave toward the Amory Ice Shelf and the Ingrid Christensen coast. Okay. Oh, okay, it just keeps just keeps rolling at the moment. So, another region sable one. What the hell is going on? Sable asked. His APC had come to a halt. 
It's some kind of navigation foul-up protector. I see. And exactly what kind of navigational foul-up is it, Commander? I'm sorry, Protector Sable, but we, we don't know as yet. We did get word that Captain Hoskins and his men are inside the mountain. It seems there were casualties, though. I see, Sable said again. Commander, we are undertaking the largest scale military operation since the Burma War, and you are telling me there's a foul up? You are telling me there are casualties? Com oh, it's Commander Organo. Okay. Commander Organo is swallowed. Yes, Protector, I am. Alright, Sable said slowly. Tell me this. Why aren't we moving? It appears that our navigational AI has been um, deceived. Deceived? Yes, Protector. We've been going in a large circle. One of our assault programmers caught it. It's a real mess out there. We're straining our background filters to our limit. We don't need excuses, Commander. We need to get to Ross Island, and fast. They've got something going, something to do with the ice. Get us onto land, quick. Yes, Protector. He gave the order, and the vehicle started up again. There was another, more violent lurch, and the groaning grew louder. Okay, um, alright, Co. I don't know who CO is. Oh, Commander Organo? <laughs> we should say what, okay. Cool, those, those two. Comedy double act. Something's going on. The ENC commander looked up from his display. We've only got two hours of our... Two of our APCs onto the island, while the rest are strung out on the ice. This storm is screwing everything up. Sable paced. Two steps left, two steps right. They're doing something. Commander Organa repeated. I don't like it. What about the power source under the ice? There's been a lot of interference of various kinds. Detection is difficult. It has been at tracing show that it's still there. Still putting out energy, but we can't tell what it's doing. Sabe? Sabe grunted but said nothing. He stared out the view field, which revealed nothing but blowing snow. Damn that infernal groaning. How do I stand it, living with this noise all the time? The vehicle lurched right, then continued. What was that? Regent demanded. Don't know, sir, the guidance officer answered. It seemed... As if the ice shifted, but it stopped now. Has it, I wonder? Okay, so just the one to go? The H. Okay. Hoskins and his men ran through the smoke, following the currents inside toward the major vertical duct indicated on their projections. Their mission was to secure the entrance, but Hoskins didn't expect much help to arrive in time to trap the quarry inside. There were too many holes, too many ways out, and those were only the ones Intercorp Intelligence knew about. Who knew how many other entrances and exits the ants might have? Be ready for anything, he warned them. They know we're in now. Aim to stop. Not kill, but be ready. Their locators kept them in touch, small telltales winking in their peripheral vision, giving relative positions based on personal monitor telemetry. The smoke thinned for a while, then thickened again. This is weird, Den said. The smoke should have stopped. They're making more. Watch out, these ants are tricky. Yeah, they can make smoke. Corporal Martin. Covering point to the advance, stepped suddenly into a clear uh, into clear air, where he was confronted by a large group of ants. He fired at once and hit someone, he was sure, when someone dropped out of nowhere and took his weapon away from him. In one frozen instant of time, he stared through the apparition's faceplate and was sure he recognised Peter DeVore. Then he died. Okay, so basically... Everything we've read has led us back up to the point at which we left off last episode. Uh. Yep. Oh well, that's Porcel, everybody. Um, and the the world didn't end. 
apparently. Or did it? Because if things are still aren't in chronological order, the world might end. But I guess we'll have to wait until next time to find out. So, if you'd like to um, discover more of the story of Portal, please join us next time for episode 14. I hope you've enjoyed this one, and until next time, take care. Bye-bye.